C A A. You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. Welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, created and hosted by Scott Knudsen, to explore the crossroads of horses and the business world. On today's show, Scott visits with professional trick writer and actress, Kansas Carradine. Now here's your host, Scott Knudsen. Hi, and welcome to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're listening to us on KCAA, the NBC affiliate in California, or watching our podcast on one of our many platforms, we really appreciate you. Today, we have a very special guest, Kansas Carradine. Kansas is from Hollywood acting legendary family, but horses really defined her performance career. As a member of the Riata Ranch Cowboy Girls, she traveled across the United States and abroad, trick riding and trick roping. She was also a member of the very famed and, and incredible Cavalia. Over a thousand performances, 12 countries, five continents. And she began training her own horses. And she was also a stunt performer in film, commercial, and TV. So Kansas, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite a while. Oh, me too. We're going to have a great time. So let's start with the beginning. What started the passion with horses? What got you going? Well, you know, for a lot of people who get into horses, you can't think of anything that a, bit, a time being without horses. And I was the same way. So I don't really ever remember not riding. Um, when I was born, so my dad is David Carradine and uh, he loved playing cowboys. And he did a film called The Long Riders and uh, had a horse in that. And he worked on another film that he fell in love with his stunt horse and he brought him home. So by the time that I was born, um, my dad had a couple horses in the backyard and I grew up with those horses all the time. And before I think I could even walk, I was, you know, popped up on him and ponied around. And then um, we lived actually in uh, North Malibu when you could ride uh, on the Los Angeles beaches. And I'd be just grew up riding on trails and on the beaches. And I got into Jim Canna as the years went on. And I had a, a cousin who was four years older than me and I just wanted to do everything that she did. And so she went into more of like the English hunter jumper and I followed suit. And um, you know, I've always, I, done dabbled in little things like dance or gymnastics but horses were the only things that I was completely passionate about and I do anything to just keep up my riding lessons and right. yeah like like any horse crazy girl that was that was me oh that's so much fun and what a blessing to get to grow up in that environment with the horses and, and uh, riding on the beach I bet it was beautiful and so much fun oh absolutely I mean Horses truly were um, a blessing in many, many ways. They were really my my safety, my sanity, my security. And um, I mean, as time evolved, it really ended up being the most consistent thing throughout my life. Um, I actually ended up, you know, going away to summer camp and never came home. There was a lot of things in my in my youth that were quite difficult, and the horses actually were the one things that I would say, you know, just kept me really solid, kept me really grounded. And I always say like, that's like, it was just a blessing from God to pluck me and put me in at Riata Ranch. And I grew up there in a really wholesome, traditional Western values lifestyle. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So let, let's talk about Riata Ranch. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very cool ranch. There's so many things to do and learn, but, and they're in California, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so the Central Valley of California, I grew up in uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I actually wanted to go again, following my cousin, I wanted to go into more of a hunter jumper and a venting background. I definitely had, a, I guess, a gutsy um, attitude with horses. So right. I really wanted to go more into cross country and do, do those kind of adventurous things. Nice. And that summer of sixth grade, I really wanted to go to a, a, a riding school called Foxfield. And I was really mad that I was being sent to, I thought I was going to prison to this ranch, you know, south of Fresno, California you know, and they were going to do wear cowboy hats. And I showed up with my britches and my helmet and I just was all English. <laughs> and the first thing that we did there, <clears throat> I showed up around lunchtime and everybody was wearing tennis shoes and jeans and t-shirts and just very relaxed and cowboy hats. 
And the first thing that we did was um, take the horses with just some nylon bridles and go swim our horses in the river. And I was sold. <laughs> and that evening, we, you know, we truck rode uh, as the sun went down and it got a little bit cooler in the, you know, the Central Valley has very, very hot summers um, here in, uh, in Exeter. And so in the evenings, we really put the truck riding saddles on and we rode until about nine o'clock. And, you know, as an 11 year old girl, being able to stand up on horses and see all these other girls who were doing these really um, athletic maneuvers, I was just, you know, sold on the first day. That was the adrenaline <laughs> right there. That's it. And I ended up asking, you know, permission to stay two weeks longer. And so that, you know, first two weeks turned into a month. Then I went home and I actually asked permission to move in with the founders, Tom and Vicki Meyer. Wow. And um, I was supposed to just stay for one semester of school. And I ended up staying for seven years until I graduated. Just moved in. <laughs> I did. I moved in. That I was like the best it. decision I've ever made. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I really, you know, God just put me in the right place. And it ended up um, bringing all these puzzle pieces together that unfolded, you know, my life's journey. So, and it's all uh, because of the horse. Yes, absolutely. I owe so much to the horse as well. But, and, and Riata ran. So what was your first um, maneuver or trick or, or unique <clears throat> ride? Yeah, I mean... I really uh, spent a lot of time working on the, I guess the uh, top strap tricks. So I did the mm -hmm. hippodrome, the one leg stand, and one that I was quite uh, known for, I guess, was the back bend. So it's a full bridge. Um, and it took me a while to, to master that, but it ended up becoming, you know, kind of my signature trick, my favorite. There's no question. Like it just felt, I, I never was um, uncomfortable in it. Uh, Cause it's, you know, uh, you have to be pretty flexible. Yes, you do. <laughs> but once I got it, I just, I just love that trick. I do it on any horse anywhere. I mean, we went to Mexico one time and we we're doing these Mexican chariotas and we were on a horse that I'd only ridden for maybe like five days and I could do it down there. We did it in Australia and trained a horse in a short period of time, did it there. I can't do it anymore. Unfortunately, I'm not quite as flexible as when I was much younger, but that was definitely, you know, a signature trick. And then the other thing I would say that was unique about Riata is we all learned um, to vault. So we all learned ground tricks. A lot of times, uh, you know, girls tend to it, moving away from a lot of the, the ground tricks because they were, they were just classified as guys tricks. It's quite different now, but you know, mm -hmm. I started in 1989 sure. and that was unique that we were all taught to vault. And so we all did a lot of vaulting, um, you know, spin horn vaults uh, and things like that. Yeah. That is awesome. Can you describe what a vault is? Maybe someone hadn't seen that. Yeah, absolutely. So a vault is actually where, you know, a horse will be uh, going at a canter or at a gallop and you bring your leg with trick riding. We always pass our legs over the front. So over the top of the horn and over the neck of the horse, we have both hands securely on the horn, hopefully. And then you touch the ground really at the, the, the same time as the horse striking, you know, uh, if you're cantering the left lead on that left front and that horse's momentum will lift you and you really can glide and get a lot of air time up into the saddle and, uh, and, and right back and you can do it again. And one of the, you know, challenges was to see how many vaults you could put in to a, a, a given uh, area, right? So how many can you s sneak in in the arena? How many can you do one time around in the round pen? That was kind it's of- It's really beautiful. It's dangerous, but it's really beautiful to watch. And, and oh, it's it's such a dance, you know, and yeah. not to segue too much, but fast forward when I did end up with Cavalia, um, we had a whole uh, classical vaulting act that was a little bit more of a, a melange or a mix with traditional bareback riding um, mm -hmm. or what you'd see kind of in classical academic vaulting. And the vaulting was so beautiful. We had some men um, and girls, but mostly the guys were the ones who were actually doing that that segment. And they really took it to a different level of artistry. It was just, uh, you know, we've always tried to um, uh, calibrate the form and perfect the lines to be really like ballet. Right. A lot of times you see trick riders and it's very, you know, hard and fast. They get to trick done, but the style is more loose. Right. And obviously, you know, my time in, in the Cavalier Circus, we really had a more um, a high value place on that precision and that artistry. So yeah, yeah. It, it's, so gorgeous. <laughs> it is, it's gorgeous. I think on your website, circuscowgirl.com, there, yeah. there's a picture of you backbending on a horse. Yeah. And, yeah. And it is, <laughs> yeah. Do what? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And it, it's just so incredible to watch. And, and, and for somebody starting out, how would somebody start out? I mean, you know, Riata Ranch is definitely a place to learn some of this stuff, but. 
Oh gosh. Well, these days I think, um, you know, learning trick riding has definitely taken its, its, its own life because there's yeah. so many forums and people really kind of collaborate and get together, you know, back in the eighties or, you know, even take it back into the sixties and seventies. Um, you really had to work with a master and know, um, uh, and get those, that mentorship. And I still would recommend that, but at the same time, these days, there's so many resources, obviously from learning through YouTube and things like that, people get exposed to a little bit more. So the idea of what is possible, um, it becomes a little bit more easy to grasp because we see it visually so many times, right. you know, you, you were talking about a picture of me doing a back bend, and I was like, it's a rare picture because to be honest, I, 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 I don't know, came of age or grew up and did a lot of my performing and performances in an era where we didn't have all this YouTube, you know, there might be some VHS t t tapes somewhere in dusty cupboards or storage, but I really don't have, you know, that much documentation of a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff that I did, pictures or videos. And um, so I think it's, it's, it's an amazing era now that has just catapulted the talent because everybody's able to really research themselves, to film each other um, and, you know, Absolutely. take that to the next level. And, and that's with all horsemanship, you know, whether you're, you're analyzing your own, whatever raining patterns, or you're really looking to watch it and play back on video is super, super helpful. Um, there's a few schools around obviously of trick riding, but it's, it's a very niche sport. You know, you don't, you're not going to find it on every corner or in every state. Even I would say there's a few little schools. And again, it's something that really has to be handed down, you know, with apprenticeship. I, I really believe that for safety, number one. Right. Absolutely. absolutely yeah yeah absolutely and you're right you know with 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 the learning on youtube and the different classes and you can watch it it really helps so much it also makes it more perfected and as the horses get better it's important that the riders do and 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 i do agree with the youtube and such i, I have everybody that you know i think it's so important once you see it and visualize it like you say it's really an advantage Absolutely. I mean, I think obviously people are able to take it to that different level because we have more technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are using technology in so many different ways, not just for video feedback, um, you know, but there's right. sensors that they hook up to horses and there's sensors that they hook up to people to see how much weight you have in your stirrups. And yeah. it's just amazing. I have no doubt that, you know, people are going to be um, kind of blowing off the top of what we used to do 20 years yeah. ago. Scott will be right back with more from Kansas Carry. Hi, I'm Scott Knudsen, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Heard on KCAA, Fridays, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about. Those that know me know I love my coffee. In the morning, afternoon, and even late in the evening, I enjoy a good cup of coffee almost any time of the day. Now, my team at the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show has been working for several months on creating and introducing our own brand of coffee. We wanted to make sure that we got it just right. We don't want to put our name on anything unless we're 100% certain that it's the best product available, and we've finally done it. We have created a wonderful line of coffees, 13 fantastic flavors offered in whole bean, ground, and K-cups, any way you like to brew your coffee. Now, each of our coffees carries our brand, the very same brand that we put on our horses, our trailers, and our chaps. So you know that this is a quality product. And we only use 100% Arabica beans, the very best beans available. Just listen to some of these wonderful blends and flavors. Jamaican Me Crazy, Honduran San Marcos, Chocolate Cherry Amaretto, Breakfast Blend, and my very favorite, Haley's Blend. A coffee so good, we named it after my daughter. You can order these coffees today by going online to javacowboy.com. That's javacowboy.com. And if you order today, you can get an extra 10% off your final purchase just by entering the promo code COWBOY on checkout. Remember, that's promo code COWBOY for an extra 10% off. Just go to javacowboy.com to order your coffee today. So you also trade pro too, correct? <laughs> I, I do. I am a trick roper. Yeah. I, I yeah. say, I'm going to just scoot over here because I see the sun is moving. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I didn't learn how to do like a musical instrument or anything, but I do know how to trick rope and it takes just about as many thousands of hours. Oh my. Um, and I have so much respect for the, mech for the charros uh, because they are really just um, incredible masters. So I do the American style trick roping, which was typically done um, with a cotton rope. 
you know, it's what was popularized by Will Rogers, of course. Yeah. Sure. And there's still a few places where you can get these ropes. They're kind of hard to come by, but um, Western Stage Props is one. And then King Ropes out of Sheridan, Wyoming is another one. And, um, you know, those ropes are pretty lifeless until you give the proper flick of a wrist. And then um, you really get to make those beautiful Flor Florio de Reata is the name of the, the Mexican style of roping and it's making flowers with the rope. Very cool. It is, it is another art form for sure. So, so when you were riding with your friend and she was riding English and then you go into the trick ride and then the trick roping, that's a full learning experience. They're both different, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I'm grateful that I had, a, I guess you could call it a classic, you know, English foundation just because uh -huh. there, every discipline has um, things that, that are useful. Mm -hmm. um, and the versatility that we all develop as horsemen really comes from, I think, cross training. So if you take a rainer and put them in a dressage class for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, I think everybody will come out of there with some good things to say and vice versa. If you take a, you know, a show jumper and put them in, um, you know, some, some reining classes or on a cutting horse, there's, there's different things that we, we learn and take around. So, um, there's never been a, a discipline that I, I can say I've tried and I didn't like. Kind of like right. Rogers, he said, he never met a man he didn't like. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I was just very grateful to have that, I guess, you know, like pony club background, but then be able to um, to really immerse myself in, I mean, here it's really the California cow horse culture. Um, even though we weren't actively, you know, doing working cow horses, that was the, the that was the real fundamentals of what Riata Ranch was right. built on. Um, and so that, you know, building a cow horse mindset was what Tom, um, Tom Meyer really prided himself on. So horsemanship was first and foremost, you know, the trick riding was there. We didn't trick ride every day. We rode and perfected, you know, our horsemanship and we rode those horses in snaffle bits and, you know, it was different than, than, than just going and making sure that we get to do our tricks, you know? Yeah. Well, being there seven years, uh, there's just so much you could learn there. What was maybe one of your favorite stories being at Riata Ranch? Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, you know, one of the toughest things that I did and it really built a lot of my character, I would say, um, when I was, I guess I was about 15, I'd already done a little bit of Roman riding or, or a fair bit. Like we had a team um, of Appaloosas that I Roman rode on, but Tom decided that he wanted to have like a real act and he acquired, um, I believe through Cotton Roster and Flying New Rodeo Company, another team of Roman horses, it was a pair of paints. And the, there's a very classic Roman riding act that you'll see in every rodeo arena and in a lot of the shows in America. And it's always that Roman team, they do a couple of maneuvers and then they jump through a hoop of fire. Um, uh, that It's just very classic. So we had this classic act and I was chosen to be the the executor of said act awesome. and these horses were um beyond my comfort zone at that time like it was really a, tr a a test to get them just over this jump and one of them would really you know accelerate the other one would kind of hesitate for it you know they never jumped together i have pictures being in a rodeo arena you know literally upside down doing the splits in the air between these two horses <laughs> And oh sometimes, my. Appear, sometimes we fly over and I just was like having such a, a block in it as a horseman to really get the grit to show up every day and just fall off because you don't I, technically we don't do that in, as trick riders yes. whereas you know if you show up as a, as a say a rough stock rider and you rodeo you know you can end up in the dirt yeah. but as a trick rider you're supposed to stay on and do your show and perform it Clearly. So I was having trouble, you know, just mentally getting over the difficulty of, you know, getting these horses. And I did one show in, um, I want to say it was in San Diego. It's a show deal, uh, where they had a lot of contract acts together. It was a big indoor arena and there was, you know, it was full. And I went and approached those horses, you know, and you come at it at a run to put them over that fire jump and fell off one time. And then we got back on. Okay, we're going to do it again. I fell off a second time. And man, the third time I look at Jennifer Welch, who is my coach at the time, she hands me the team because we have to collect these two horses and they're not tied together. Um, I, don't, I don't believe in tying two horses together. They just break equipment. And so we pop them together and I just looked with this look of anger and frustration. And, and she's like, okay, you're just going to school them good. And I stood up one more time. I said, no, I am putting them over. I'm going to do this. And obviously that time, 
that I put them over, stayed on, everything was good. Boy, did the crowd go <laughs> wild. <clears throat> and it was, it was, you know, obviously a crowning moment. It was really, really fun, but it was just the, the, um, the epitome of, you know, really having that determination, really trusting in yourself. It wasn't a mental thing that I could say I executed a certain amount of adjustments. This was mm -hmm. not intellectual. And I think with horses, a lot of it just comes from your, your body, your practice. If you practice things, right. you know, correctly, and then really we can all say from the grace of God, Absolutely. because um, it was just, oh, I thought I was doing it right. Every, those first two times that I fell off, I'll just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but the third time everything worked out well. And, you know, when, when all the horses come together, cause you got three minds that you have to unify with. And, and that's the, the sign of a, a, a completion and a job well done. Such a strong story, and 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 that's a that's a deal for anyone watching or listening. It's just to get back on and keep trying. But once it comes together, it's nothing more special. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah so and the horses so, are always the greatest greatest teachers in that. I would just add, like absolutely. those horses weren't easy, and that was the thing that you know to be able to stick with it when you don't have all the answers, and it's not just like an easy match, and to really kind of keep showing up. You know, right. there's so much um, character building in that in that exercise for life. A absolutely, 100. percent You got to keep showing up, and the horses. You know, they've always taught me so much more than I've ever taught them. You know, and, and that's the fun part. But when you have that fun ride, it's it's nothing better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I say more and more like, the more I learn, the less I know I know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I don't know anything. <laughs> I'm not letting them teach me and trying to keep open and listen. Yes, absolutely. So do you change your act uh, depending on where you're going, whether it's an indoor or an outdoor? Oh, I have over the years, but you know, the interesting thing is my life has really um, adjusted a lot with my family life. So mm -hmm. I am, uh, I don't have like my own solo act. I make it up if I get hired to do something like that. But a lot of times I've been working behind the scenes. So for example, with the company Cavalia, I did a lot of like scouting and buying and training the horses. So less glamorous, you know, I didn't have a show schedule some, for, for some years. I, I joke that I took extended maternity leaves. You know, my girls are 12 and 15 now. Um, and uh, I oftentimes would transition from, you know, doing those seven to 10 shows a week to having more of a stable environment and um, staying at home and training horses. So, wow. um, but to answer your question, yes, I've done a lot of adaptations depending on if I'm just flying somewhere and just doing a roping gig, or if I'm actually, you know, performing in front of say uh, a Quebec Western festival yeah. and doing a, um, a Western act for that. Or if I'm, you know, part of a group and doing a, an ensemble event. I mean, the last time that I did uh, the Cavalia show was actually in China and we had a six month run there on mainland China. Good. Okay. So we got, let's talk about that a little bit. So when somebody, when you go to China, how do you take your horses over there and how does somebody go in advance and kind of scout the area? Um, well, so I'm going to rewind a little bit because in terms of like the way the Cavalia show works, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's its own um, uh, barn, it's its own entity. And so that whole stable, like all of our stalls, all of our, you know, our big top and all of our horses, all of our equipment, yes, they all ship together. And typically, you know, when we were on tour, we stay in each city about uh, two months. Um, and then the setup and tear down, depending on if we were changing countries or if we were just driving in the U.S., but it's going to be about, you know, 17 days um, and sometimes longer. You know, for example, when we went from California to Australia, there was a very long quarantine. And so then it was a five week um, uh, break. And then I want to say it took us maybe two weeks to put the show back together, maybe three, something like that. Um, and basically, you know, all the stalls are set up there. So the barn looks the same in every city. We have, we bring our own, um, the, the, the footprint looks a little bit different in terms like, you know, the kitchen tent might be in a different place, the stalls, but basically, you know, the big top, the arena is in the same place, the entrance um, into the big top where it links with the warm up tent and to the stables tent, that's all in the same place. This configuration is the same. Um, but it's an incredible infrastructure. And when we go into China, you know, the show was touring around China. So everything got shipped there. And then, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a production company that we partnered with and it would stay in, on mainland China. 
but the other countries, you know, we went uh, all over North America. Then from uh, California, we went to Australia and did five cities in Los Australia, wow. from Australia to Abu Dhabi, then um, Abu Dhabi to Dubai, Dubai to Belgium, Brussels, Belgium, from Belgium to um, Singapore. And then in Singapore, I took a mommy break and uh, went back to California and was training horses and buying horses uh, to ship to China and helping in that regard. Because I have my, my daughter, I think was four and seven or eight at the time. And Very so I just took a, a break from tour, but the tour continued and went from Singapore to Hong Kong to you know Taiwan, um, Seoul, uh, and then mainland China. And my husband is involved in it. So he was staying on tour. And then I was back at a home ranch in California where I would, you know, scout by and train horses and then get them ready for, for transport. And then also, you know, receive Incredible. horses. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. So, so what was the experience like when you were in the different countries? Did they know Cavalia? Did they understand the trick riding part of the, the balancing and the dance and the, and the beauty? Did they... Well, I mean, trick riding is just one little part of that whole mm -hmm. show. So yeah, the sequence of the show is really about, um, you know, projecting the, the relationship between horses and humans over time. Right, right. And I think the, uh, you know, as we went around the world, certain places have a very established horse culture. You know, in Australia, right. they have an established horse culture, mm -hmm. a lot of horse showings. So they appreciated it. Um, and it's different than when you take it to a place like China, where it's a very new horse culture. And so they're quite... Um, easily uh surprised with wow look at this relationship that horses and humans have together and it's so playful and you know horses are kind of like a dog and it was it was very uh, my husband because he's the artistic director so he would sit in the public a lot and he said you could always tell the interesting moments because all the phones would come up and everybody would be filming not not no applause but everybody filming um and then the moments where you know there was a lot of affection between the horses and riders that was really profound because it was just showing kind of, you know, that deep relationship. It's all about the connection with the horse at the end of the day. And that's something that more than a trick, more than a beautiful, you know, piaf or lay down or rear or trick, trick riding was this relationship. And that I would say was the kind of lasting impression that was incredible. Um, another, you know, uh, I, I Singapore loved the show. Singapore was a really good Did popular. That. Europe loves the show. You know, it was it was great um, in so many different ways in so many different places. Oh man! Then, okay, I'm going to ask you a hard question. So okay, so, so I'm gonna rotate again here. Yeah, let's keep going, dancing around that sun. So, yeah. what is your what was it like maybe the most rewarding? Was it being on stage with the horse? Or was it training your horse and putting the horse out there with someone else and taking that, that, um, letting, letting it go? Yeah, that's a hard question. Yeah. Um, because I think they can both be fulfilling in different ways. Mm -hmm. One of them is really an attitude of service. And I, I think that that's really, you know, to be a servant, to help others. My goal with the horses was really to give them the best start. Because if people liked their horse, then that horse was obviously going to have a better life than if he was, you know, needing a lot of corrections, or if he was just, you know, somebody that, like not, a, not comfortable to ride. That's another thing too. You like, you want a horse that actually has a really good carriage because like, oh man, I have to ride that horse again. Then, you know, I wanted to sure. get, I wanted to source out horses that would be happy in their job, source out horses that would, their riders would be proud to, to be um, paired up with. Wow. Um, and so those that worked out, obviously, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, um, pride yeah. and gratitude in that. And at the same time, you know, I have to say one of the highlights of my performance career was when I was in Montreal and performing in the show. Um, and this is like 2005, so it's pretty early on. And those who've seen the original Cavalier show, it was a very girl power show. It had a lot of, you know, positive female energy. Um, being able to do incredible things and so you had uh, the girls doing you know the Roman riding and then eventually taking the four up and so I got to play that character you know and it's just a great written part um, and one day you know uh, I actually rode with my I was I was pregnant with my my girls and kept trick riding um, until I was about three months for both pregnancies and so this time you know it was just a hard day it was really hot in Montreal and I just thought 
oh man, I just had to gather everything I could to get out there again. And I went and, you know, doing 10 shows a week. It's a, it's, it's That's a, a lot. Physically demanding. Sure. And to kind of hold, it's different than just kind of performing your horse, but you really are expressive. You know, you're turning it on for the public, as you know, you know, even doing your show here. Yeah. Um, but anyway, long story short, I did that act. And at the end of it, you know, there's just this moment of triumph where the, you know, the girl Roman rider uh, uh, calls out, you know, this kind of victory call at the end of it after doing, you know, the, the four up and, and jumping horses. And there was this huge thunderous applause and boy, that whole, you know, 2000 foot, 2000 seat theater, you know, stood up on their feet and gave an ovation for that one moment. And, um, yeah, you have a lot of, of pride and joy and that's a fun thing. It's very satisfying, you know, as far as a, as a job well done. So they're really two different things. Like one Absolutely. obviously is, is serving my own passion and joy. And like, I would say the culmination of all those years since I was 11 years old, you know, training to be um, a performer in the Western arts. Right. Um, but the other piece is really just, you know, being a, a servant and trying to do the best to really help others and help the horses. So I can't really pit one against the other. You know, they're, they're both, both special. Really very yeah. special. Yeah. 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 That's so cool. Thank you for listening to the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. Scott will be right back with Kansas Herodine. For more information on Scott Knudsen, the Cowboy Entrepreneur, visit us online at cowboyentrepreneur.com. Hello, I'm Scott Knudsen, host of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. I want to tell you about a product I've tried and I love and I feel the Cowboy Entrepreneur audience will as well. It's Rebellious Infusions. Rebellious Infusions, there are little packets of flavor. And you know, it gets hot in South Texas, over 100 degrees every day. And I like my water, but it's water. So I use these infusions, put them in my water. It makes it cold. It's great flavor, zero sugar, zero calories. It's pure energy infusions, rebellious infusions. Go to drinkrebellious.com or on all social media platforms. Drink Rebellious. So, so when you were pit selecting horses, what, what did you look at a specific breed or temperament or color or how did you go about that? Um, so with trick riding horses and in shows and performance horses in general, a lot of people like to have color. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can find the, the buckskins, you know, the Appaloosas, the paints, I, I leaned toward the quarter horse types because that's what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Cavalia is quite a blend with the European um, influence as well. And so you know, over time we would, we would open up to other breeds as well. And there were some, you know, European uh, horses and breeds that came into the show, but I always leaned toward the quarter horses because that was my favorite. So quarter horses, sure. apple and paints. Um, and uh, my, the main thing that I look again, trying to find a horse that will be a, a good match for everybody. Some horses can be a little bit trickier than that. If you say like, Hey, they're a one man horse, or they're just a specific type of, of, um, you know, expert horsemen. And um, I would try to find also horses that could be more adaptable to everyone. So in terms of just having that like extrovert personality um, that would, uh, you know, be able to take a big, a lot of changes and change of change of riders. So basically a horse that has a lot of self-confidence um, and pretty much in the first, you know, five, 10 minutes, you can suss a horse out and be able to see you know, if they're able to take new um, experiences quickly, if they're, you know, a little bit more reactive, how long is it going to take to reduce that kind of reactivity? It's not that I want to dull a horse down at all, but there's certain, um, like you want to keep their, their whole senses and awareness. I don't like to use the word, you know, desensitizing too much because we really want them to be, you know, alert and looking out for you. I have a whole a separate story about that but that they're tolerant, that their temperament will tolerate it. I think that's a, an important distinction. Right. Um, it's not that they don't feel it. It's not that they're numb. It's that they're accepting of it. You know, that's a, yeah. that's a different thing. Um, and, you know, uh, just an example. So again, I already spoke about how I trick rode in the show when I was pregnant and I was doing a, a trick called the Cossack drag, which is where you hang upside down by one foot. Um, and in California, or in California, in Cavalia, the, it's a straight line trick riding. So, you know, both of the horses, um, the horses will come from either side of the stage on that straight line, okay? And we'll take turns. And um, it's probably one of the most dangerous things that we do in the show. 
because uh, you know, those horses are running full speed, you can kind of hit that corner a little bit blind um, and horses could come out and have a head-on collision. It's very, very potentially dangerous. Wow. So I was down in my trick, long story short, and somebody um, came out at the wrong time with their horse oh and was headed straight toward me. And my horse was as straight as an arrow. I actually, you know, I put him in for trick riding. I trained him and he was just very, very, very solid. And we had, you know, total confidence and consistency, I would say. And um, I was in my trick and I was like, gosh, that feels really strange. But, you know, he went off the line and I kind of got after him a little bit. Like, what, what, what was going on with that? Well, little did I know that this other horse had come to pass right on the side of where I was. It would have been a big wreck. And my horse saw that other horse coming and got out of the way and oh, came wow. back in his mind. And so he knew. And so that's that horse taking care of you. Yeah. That's not a horse who's being dull and desensitized. Right. He had all of his senses alert. Back, and he's alert and he's able to think. And so, you know, it, it just takes time to be able to understand, you know, um, a, a horse that's, that's highly aware and sensitive and can partner because ultimately, you know, trick riding is at liberty. You're not holding the horse. There's, you're, you, you can stop and start all you want, but ultimately when you're in your trick, you're not holding on to anything. You're not controlling the horse. And so there's ultimate trust there. Right. And a horse that you really want to surrender your life to and trust in that way has to be, you know, has to have a, a lot of truth and confidence and have that heart of gold. And then in, on a little like technical side, obviously you want him to be 100% sound. You want him to be, you know, have a, a smooth, comfortable gait. And, and again, I lean toward like the quarter horse types because they'll come off that straight, that line real quick. And then at the same time, they'll relax and like those ranch, ranch minded horses mm -hmm. um, will just let you practice all of your, your, um, yeah. you know, yoga moves that are <laughs> your acrobatics over and over again, stand still and wait for you. That's so awesome. And I love how they protect and, and, and they just have that keen sense to keep you out of trouble. That's a great story. And yeah, I love what you just said, surrender your life, because really that's what you're doing. It's complete trust. Yeah. Complete trust. So when you train a horse and, and you turn the horse over to somebody that's maybe riding in Cavalia and you're not going to do it anymore, how do you get that horse to trust somebody else? Um, you know, I think that that's something when I'm looking in the beginning, like of temperament, mm -hmm. um, to be able to have that flexibility. You know, there's certain horses that you say, oh, okay. And I've had them before, you know, there's a couple of horses that I got that I said, this is not a horse who's going to be able to change riders a lot. You know, they might not work in the short or a horse that, you know, okay, they're going to work well for me. You have to, if you know, as you're going through the process that you have to be like, hold them with kick gloves. That's right. kind of like a warning sign that, you know what, they're probably going to be a little bit too, say emotionally, you know, dependent or emotionally sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, that they won't be able to have that resilience of being flexible and, you know, and changing riders. Um, and the other thing that really helps is obviously we communicate a lot, you know, between, um, t between people and people who want to know people, you know, good riders are obviously going to want to know as much as they can and understand and really get that backstory. Um, but, you know, dealing with professionals, they can usually kind of come on, we say, and make the blend. Um, the other thing that I find that's useful is if you are somebody who's, you know, been in the show, been in that environment, you know what you have to prepare them for, you know how they're going to be ridden. For example, you know, we're not allowed to use, you know, spurs and um, so they have to have a certain sensitivity. They're going to be able to do, they're going to be asked to do a lot of dressage, you know, not our, our all our trick riding oh. horses are just going to be, you're not allowed to use anything other than a snaffle bit, you know, so all of these preps. If I was to send a horse in there, you know, they're going to have a whole rude awakening if they go straight from, say, being in, you know, a shank bit and then, okay, no, you're only in a snaffle now and you're going to have to do a lot of dressage and sorry, but we're not going to use any spur. <laughs> so all of these things that you kind of like layer in and pre prepare, you know, knowing what they're going to go into. And then, you know, the last layer and piece is a lot about, you know, the environment and just exposing them to as many things as possible. Um, because they're going to have to get the lights and the music and the water and, you know, the costumes and the sound of the roaring public and, you know, whatever it is, bungees flying from, from the sky. The yeah. I rope, yeah, fire. Yeah. Uh. I rope a lot, you know, on the horses because that's such a good experience. And then again, I think life just introduces you teaching moments that help arise organically. And so as my children grew up, 
I just put my kids on him a lot. And, um, you know, the kids might not have ever touched the reins when they were little, but I'd have them pack them around and I'd work them, you know, on long reins and things like that. And so then, you know, this is another way that they're just having a bunch of people crawl all over them and, and, you know, get used to them that way. Yeah. That's awesome. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. So what age are you looking for? And and what's the process? So are you looking for like a three-year-old and it's going to take a year to train before you can get them off or? What's well, actually, because, actually, because, you know, the horses, we don't usually have as much time as right. the investment, like people would often ask if we have a breeding program and we don't, or if we get them, as, you know, like you said, like two, three year olds and we don't. So mm-hmm. typically we're looking for a horse that's already finished or, um, you know, between like five and, you know, seven um, is ideal. Mm-hmm. You can take them all the way up to nine, but it's actually harder to find them at that point because if they're really good, people don't want to let them go. Never one, sure. they're in their prime. Um, but even the horses that were imported, say from Europe, a lot of the horses are, you know, five, six years old and up to like seven or eight. Um, and then we can go ahead and spend time to give them this new vocabulary if they're learning the Roman writing, if they're learning the trick writing. So we spend so much time on these specialties that the foundational skills will already be there and in place. I see. I see. That makes sense. And then Absolutely. we can refine them, refine them as well. Um, but there's just, there, you're adding, it's like, okay, if we're all going to learn calculus here, everybody better have already done their algebra. You Absolutely. Know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Makes sense. It makes sense. So were you ever in a performance where maybe the horse went off script? Oh gosh, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of great acts have been born out of that, you know, that things kind of like happen um, that you don't expect. Um, I mean, just kind of watching others, you know, we have a lot of liberty in the show. And um, I mean, I think it it speaks a lot to the evolution of how we've been able to watch horse shows Mm -hmm. instead of having things to be so rigid or um, very tightly planned out, but things that happen that you don't expect and then the audience actually laughs like, hey, there's that horse who's not joining up with his team. Or, you know, you have a horse that's laying down. They don't want to get up. And everybody starts laughing about it. And I think everybody's heart really softens. And it actually makes this kind of endearing moment that everybody appreciates because you're allowing the horse to kind of be themselves in that moment. And, um, you know, it, again, that started like 20 years ago. And so now I think it's really affected a lot of the the way that we look at horse performance like we allow those little moments because they're actually special you know my dad as an actor um he would always say that something happens naturally in the life uh, you know on stage or when you're filming or when you're working like take that that makes the moment more real and so it's the same thing like when you're working with horses and performance if something that happens that's that's um that's really alive in that moment it brings you to the present it feels more special and i think the audience gets excited about that because they know that they're watching something totally unique and this is why live entertainment you know is so important and so special and wow. horses every night you know will change that up and obviously you know going back to what i did a lot which was the trick riding those kind of things do have to be very calculated in time because there's a danger factor in there so you don't want a horse to, for example, take off before they're meant to and have, you know, uh, an accident. Right. Um, but when you're doing some other things, you know, and obviously in the Liberty, that's where you really see, you know, the appreciation for all of the candid moments. Um, right. And then this really shines and, and it unfolds in a way that every performer loves, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's so stuff. cool to see the personality, though, when they... You know, not mess up the whole app, but they just get a little bit off script, like you say, and it's just like, it humanizes, if, if that's such a word for a horse, but the moment. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Well, and I think, it, you know, we're all brought up that, you know, a horse is our partner for work. Um, you know, I oftentimes was taught, you know, horse is not a pet, don't treat him like a pet. Um, but at the same time, he's also not a motorcycle. And so, right. you know, we, we've all evolved, I think, quite a bit to really understand um, that the relationship is so important and that really having that, you know, deep connection with them, that speaks volumes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So special. We have some, um, some guests who have arrived. So I don't know what Do other we? Is you hear, but my, my, um, kids who came in from outside. So I have two girls, one's 15 oh. and one is 
12. And I don't know if you hear here also, we have a, a dog who's walking around. Just let me know if the- I love it. No, it's great. Okay, life, speaking of those unscripted yeah, moments- Yeah, you just go with it. That's what just happened, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so cool. Yeah, just keep going. So Liberty, we've talked a little bit about Liberty and, and uh, did they want to get on? Do you want to say hi? So this is my oldest daughter, Phoenix. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm pretty good, and you? Oh, we're doing well. Are you having fun on the road? Yeah, lots. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I love the road. And then this is my other daughter, Hi. Marie. <laughs> How are you? They're I'm beautiful. Doing, you? doing well. Doing what? We're talking horses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they probably have a lot to say. They've done all kinds of amazing things since the last couple weeks of horses. Is it so much fun? And we're just going to talk about Liberty, actually. You should ask these yes. girls what they, what they think about Liberty or what they've seen with Liberty in the last Yeah, week. let's talk Liberty. What do y'all think? We, we just came from the International Liberty Horse Association Championships in Lexington, Kentucky. Very and it's cool. an organization, a new, new association that started up by Dan and Elizabeth James in Lexington there. And, um, oh man, I'm so excited. I, I just really think that this new association is going to open up the sport so much more and that it's really going to bring a whole new generation of, um, of horsemanship and a different style of horsemanship and really take it to the next level. And then obviously there's all these classes for great youth and, um, different people coming in. So girls, do you want to, yeah, you want to talk about it? What did y'all like about it? Um, I really, really like the way that it makes the horses feel like they're more free mm -hmm. and like that they get to be themselves a lot more because when you're doing more riding and you're really asking them to do things, it's a lot more than when you're just doing Liberty and it's kind of fun for them to play. So it's a lot of fun like that. And yeah. it's also fun for the people because if they don't want to do like more hard things, they can just play with them and do the Liberty. So, yeah. That's fun. That's really cool. Will yeah. you tell them some of the things that you got to do this last week? Like, what were you working on? Well, I was working a lot on having a team of ponies to do Roman riding, but at Liberty. So we were doing it first with like a halter and just some lead ropes. And then um, I was having a really hard time. And I was like, no, I don't think it's going to work. Like, maybe I shouldn't just spend some time on them. And then like a couple days later, I was with this other friend of mine and um we just like hopped on them without anything so no bridle no saddle and we just like steered them with the whips and i was finding it's really working like they're always together and they're always staying there and then i even got to stand up on them a little bit and do some Fun. Really cool yeah Fun. oh and my god do i mean me and my sister we both did some stuff with dan's liberty team mm -hmm. so that was really a lot of fun and we had a nice guy named patrick he um, helped us with our liberty, and we got to use Dan's horses, and that was really, really fun. Oh, and we got wow. to wear bareback and do some liberty, like just from a ridden horse and on the ground. So that was really fun. What a great experience. Yeah. yeah. So much fun. Phoenix helped out um, quite a bit, too. I got to work with the horses. So Phoenix, what was one of the things that really stood out for you, and what did you enjoy? Um, I mean, yeah, it was really amazing working Liberty because I haven't done much Liberty and this was like the first time that I really got to do a lot of Liberty and learn with these amazing horses and of course the amazing trainers. And I just think it's so wonderful how in Liberty you really see more of that connection because when you're sitting on a horse and you have a, a bridle with reins, the horse doesn't really have much of a choice but to listen to you because you're just, you know, you're on top of him. Right. And with, but with Liberty, you really see that the connection between the trainer and the horse and how the horse learns to listen to you of its own free will. So, yeah. Because yeah, it so wants to. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and at the same time, you know, you did quite a bit while you were still on top of them. Yeah. In terms of bridalists. So that's the really exciting thing, too, that awesome. the International Liberty Horse Association has is it encompasses all the bridalist work. Mm -hmm. So there's some great classes. Like, you know, we saw the seven year old girl who had a combined class where she came in with this little core horse mare. She did a little Liberty on the ground with them, you know, had them go through, you know, change of directions. Then she laid them down. Then she got on and then she did a pattern with her neck rope. You know, it's a whole bridal is bareback and that's a combined class. You know, you can enter that and, and, you know, youth, senior, you know, pro, non-pro. 
And so I just think it's great how this organization has been able to kind of create a framework, a structure, so people have goals to work for, work toward. Because Phoenix, you were doing some other stuff that was um, mounted, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have, you're on top of one horse and then you have two other horses that you're guiding with your, a whip, you, that's like an extension of your arm. And yeah, but from another horse. So you, we had like three. So you're sitting on one and then you have two going around you. It's really amazing. Very fun, very yeah. fun. Yeah, so the, the Liberty from a Ridden Horse was a really great opportunity. And both uh, Elizabeth and Dan James were just so kind. They have a beautiful facility out there in um, Lexington, Kentucky. And then Bodie mentioned Patrick. Patrick Sull Sullivan is another one of um, Dan's students. I could say one of his uh, longtime students. He actually just completed an incredible ride coming all the way from California to Lexington, Kentucky bareback and bridalist. Well, oh actually, sometimes he did put a saddle on. He found it was better for his horse's back, but basically at Liberty, you know, wow. and, um, he raised a lot of money for some wonderful, uh, you know, equine charities and uh, nonprofits along the way. And just his passion for it is so contagious. And, uh, and same thing, you know, we were surrounded by all these different breeds, all different, you know, uh, walks of life in terms of riders. And it was just kind of like a meeting of this eclectic horseman. And uh, I just can't wait to see where it goes to. It's really, really fun. Isn't that exciting about the industry, though? There's different age groups and different people and new people coming into the, to the industry. And that's what's so important. It's so much fun to see. Absolutely. Yeah, I have no doubt that the next 25 years are going to be you know, revolutionary. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> it takes uh, all of us in the horse world it's beyond like what? What she's going to see and like i said this seven-year-old girl who's in there just their idea of what is possible you know is amazing i was actually invited there to help judge the freestyle competition and some of the acts that i saw you know were very professional and you know 20 years ago you wouldn't be able to find that it was no. um you know and thinking of what we were presenting in the show in cavalia there was things in that competition that were really on par especially wow. what would be, you know at the, at the beginning of cavalia so i, I think they're all very um uh, interlinked, intertwined, they all have affected each other, you know, it's all connected. And I sure. just feel so blessed to have seen it from so many different angles and to be able to watch a little bit of where it's where it's headed. It's so cool. And it's a generational deal too. And, and you get to be a part of, you know, giving it to your daughters and me with my daughter to give it to them and then they get to carry it on. Yeah. You know, that's, well, I haven't that's... Heard it, but what does your daughter do in terms of all of her riding disciplines? And what oh my passion? goodness. She loves riding. She loves riding Western, but her favorite thing now is imprinting foals. When we have babies, she, I mean, the first day she's got them laying on the ground and she's laying with them. And, and now they're like in your pocket. It, it's so much fun. And, and uh, but when she was a little baby, you know, we'd put her, you know, with the horses and they just have a way. They would just calm them down. And she was great. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'd love yeah. to meet her someday. I'm yeah, sure. I wish she was here for sure. For sure. So, so what is, what's next for y'all uh, as far as being on the road? Is it another Liberty competition or event or a judge? Well, I definitely feel like I'm inspired enough just to help, you know, that association start to um, become more uh, prevalent out here in the West. There wasn't as much of a representation. And I think that there's, it's wide open. You know, there's so many great um, horse people out here who are already doing this, say Liberty bridalist, that kind of work and um, just don't, perhaps know about it. So right. Absolutely. Um, that's one of the things that I'm definitely passionate about. And at the same time, you know, I still, you know, perform and um, there's a circus that will be picking up um, uh, this over the holidays that I'll be doing kind of in partnership with Riata Ranch. And so Phoenix will get a chance to go ahead and do some performances with that. We'll be doing a little bit of what trick riding, rope riding and roping. Phoenix is also a, um, a circus artist too. So are you really? So what do you do? Um, I do all sorts of stuff. I mean, I really like doing aerial. So basically everything that's in the air, like the silk, uh, the hoop, I do a lot of hoop. And um, I definitely like acrobatics and then trick riding for the horses. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the, both my girls have learned to rope and, and trick ride. And I think it's just natural that, you know, we pass it on. There's so many great 
story. families who in, in, that's part of you know the circus obviously is it's, yeah. it's it's very common and you can hear the life of a family behind this <laughs> it's very common that everybody you know passes down and shares that that whole tradition so absolutely. i have no doubt that um you know phoenix will kind of take it all to the next level and she's able to do great things you know her father was an acrobat um a uh, very high level acrobat for a long time and so she does things that i will never try to do <laughs> um, but in her mind she can she can perceive stuff that would just be you know out of my um my imagination and for her that's totally normal <laughs> but isn't that fun to see you know when your kids are just can do more and passing you know not passing the torch but they're just exceeding it yeah yeah it's, absolutely it's, absolutely in ways again that were yeah totally mind-blowing and that I would never ever expect you know and they love horses Bodhi too you know she has her own passion like she loves working with the ponies she loves working at Liberty she's always loved to try and be you know as bareback and bridalist as possible that's always been her thing Phoenix has always been um, really interested in learning all the details of like the trick riding and being very um, uh, specific and, and perfecting that she's already done you know uh, several shows and things like that with the roping and We've, we've been able to do quite a bit of shows out in Quebec, and we were talking a little bit before the recording began about how unique the Quebec Western culture is, and I feel so uh, blessed again to have had a glimpse of it firsthand. It's very, very specific, special, unique cultural um, cultural experience, and they have the, you know their own rodeos and their own you know, Western festivals, and they just love it. And so you bring, a, there's no, there's hardly any trick riders or ropers out there. So we come there and they just go nuts for oh, it. Because, you know, it's for us, it's just normal. That's what we grew up with. Um, but there, it's just like, there's such an extra level of, of um, awe, splendor, respect, you know, for anything that is Western culture. It's really fun. Oh, I bet it's fun to see their faces, you know, when they come out and they see the real deal with y'all. I bet they just light up. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. There's no question about it. I mean, my dad, he would say that, um, you know, the Westerns is America's Shakespeare. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, it, it, it is. I grew up on them. I still watch them all the time. I love Westerns, and you're right. You're right. Um, so I, I know you do a lot with nonprofits, or y'all do a lot with nonprofits, and and I was reading a little bit about that. So um, I know that's a passion. So when nonprofits, do you have any advice for a nonprofit trying to start out or stay relevant? That's a really good question. I mean, I think right now it's very exciting because um, it's becoming more common now that uh, people, you know, say 20 years ago, you talk about horse therapy and people say, what do you mean? And now we've can, we have so much evidence. We have so much documentation Amazing. of how effective, you know, equine guided education can be for, you know, um, veterans, for people with PTSD, for those, you know, trauma and abuse survivors. Um, and really for people like me who just needed to have a consistent, healthy um, lifestyle, that the horses can do that even without making it a therapy session, you know, just being around the horses, right. like the, what do they say? The best thing for the inside of a man is the outside of a horse. Um, and I'm a firm believer in that. And there's so many nonprofits that, you know, see the value of adding that to their, you know, their treatment programs, you know, for um, uh, getting relief from substance abuse and things like this. And also for mentorship and, and youth um, to be able to find uh, confidence and stability in their life you know, it, it, adopting equestrian programs in that is just really, really been um, very effective. And so I think now with all of the research that has been done, I, I imagine for um, nonprofits to be able to use that as supportive. And also now that we have all of this liberty work um, that is becoming more popular and that's becoming, um, I, I guess, more attainable, um, this is a great way that horses who've been through um, that, that are kind of on the rescue track, or maybe even they're kind of geriatric and it's just, they're not sound enough to ride anymore. It's a great way for them to still have a job and to have meaningful work. And, in, or maybe it's the, the horse handler whose back is sore and they can't ride anymore. Now we have something else that I think nonprofits are really going to be using a lot, um, both with the Liberty and obviously with the, um, you know, assisted riding. Um, I worked a lot with a company or an organization called uh, Equine Guided Education uh, with a gal named Ariana Strozzi. And she's really one of my greatest teachers. 
um, you know, when I had Phoenix, it's, it's interesting that she's right here. I kind of did my own um, discovery of redefining horsemanship and my relationship with horses because it always been um, kind of uh, uh, work. It had always right. been associated with work. And so after having Phoenix, I just thought, you know, there's something so much more here to my relationship. I know that horses have healed me in a certain way. I want to discover more about that. And so I went to go study with my friend Ariana and, um, you know, she would do a lot of women's retreats and uh, not just women, but it, it ended up being a lot of times it was ladies around. Um, and it evolved also to a lot of veterans coming back and really with non-ridden work, work that was just all, you know, on the ground, just being with the horses. I have seen incredible transformations take place. I've seen people really go through um, deep cathartic experiences and that personal development that comes from just really being around um, these incredible creatures that somehow, you know, they bring us into presence. I'll put it that way in a very simple way, you know, um, with equine guided, guided education and Ariana's work, we talk a lot about body awareness. It's something we don't think about as much, you know, as horsemen, we're around it all the time. So I think we take it for granted, right. but you have to know where to stand to not get, you know, kicked. You have to know yeah. what's around you in your present environment um, to, you know, to look out and be safe for you and for your horse. And so you develop a higher sense of awareness and we could say like also a body consciousness and just having that um, for people who might, you know, have never been grown up on a farm, never been around horses. There's something that it does to our physiology. And again, now I think this research is all coming out. It's all there. Um, and it's so exciting. It is so exciting. It's like, how could we prove in the past that horses were so good for the spirit? And now there's science that actually does. Yeah. Um, and so again, it's just another kind of side project. At any time that I can find an opportunity to be working for you know, nonprofits and help um, share that, it's not only the written work um, that I'm passionate about, but also again, you know, to have all of these learning and teaching experiences and self-development work that comes with being around horses, that's just as valuable. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so much fun. And it's so, it, it, like you say, it's so valuable. And, you know, whenever we try and do something like that, we make time for it. It really helps me personally, probably more than anyone else, because you leave there and you're like, it was just an amazing experience. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And everybody has, you know, everybody has a different story that yeah. oh, they never get old and you never expect it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody that's right. has something that's, oh, okay, wow. You know, horses just bring us all together in such unique ways mm -hmm. and um, and are continuing to help us grow. Right. I think in ways that we would not otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And to be honest, to be fair, obviously it's not just horses. It just happens to be we're talking about horses. People have had lots of amazing experience through other things in their lives and through other animals or we could say even other experiences with nature. Um, but really the horse is just such a big magnetizing subject and that's what brought us all together. Um, you know, Tom Meyer, my trainer, so many years ago, he would always say that, you know, how we were all brought together. It's really the horse. The horse yeah. is the key. He's the integral part of it all. The nucleus. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Kansas, thank you so much for being on the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show and Phoenix and Bodie. I want to thank y'all too for being on. It's like just awesome. And, and uh, I really appreciate y'all taking time to be on the show. Oh, it was just such a blessing. We're really, really grateful to do this. And who knows, maybe we can see you another time, hopefully in person. I and really hope so. I really hope so. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll definitely be looking out for some of our other friends. I bet he'll be on with you as well. Absolutely, for sure. Well, thank y'all so much. It's so good to see y'all. Y'all keep riding now. Okay. Yeah, take Bye. care. Bye. 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 Thank you to all the great sponsors of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show. If you or your business is interested in being a sponsor of the Cowboy Entrepreneur Show, please call our office at 830-992-1786 or visit our website, cowboyentrepreneur.com. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM, and